Hello and welcome to day number five of the TT Lock-In Fueled by Monster Energy. Today would have been a full day of racing over on the island with the lightweight TT and the second Monster Energy Super Sport race. But never fear, we've still got plenty of action coming up tonight, including day number three from the virtual TT powered by Motul. First up, we have Team Toniuti, followed by Team Cummins. We also have a great feature coming up on the official TT and classic TT helmet partner, Arai. And don't forget the RX7V IOM TT 2020 edition is available from your local RI dealer now. And joining Steve Plater and myself in the TT Lock-In Live tonight is Philip McCallum and Brian Reed. But first, it's time to delve back into the archives with the Ultimate TT Racers presented by Bennett. This time, it's 1994 and one of the more surreal racers from the aisle. This is the Junior TT. And the first race on the Wednesday morning program is the combined Supersport 400 and Junior event. Now, here's local resident Norman Wisdom trying Philip McCallum's 250 Honda for size. Well, Philip McCallum was fastest in practice. His thoughts on the race. I would say Brian Reed's been there each year now for a couple of years, and Joey's been there also, and uh, you've got a few other boys as well, so. I just wouldn't say it's going to be easy, but we'll try our best and see what happens. Many of the top riders say that uh, the 250 race is, is their favourite one because the 250s are so sort of pliable around here. Is it one of your favourite races? Do you prefer to ride the 250 than the 750? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't prefer to ride it than the 750, but it's an easier ride. The 250 is a much smaller, lighter bike. On a, it's a full Grand Prix style machine, so it's easier to uh, change direction and flip around. And, um, we sort of we call it the toy compared to the 750, so <laughs> this is our, our fun race. Four laps, 155 miles to go. Number one, Ian Simpson on the 250 Norrie Limburn, Tom French Haulage Honda sets the pace. Number three, Ian Locker, and he is still the lap record holder as he goes away on the Snowden Garages Honda. And at Braddon Bridge. Ian Simpson, number one, having a very rare outing on a 250, it has to be said. In fact, the last time he rode a 250 was back in 1986 in his club racing days. Not this man, though. This is 16 times a TT winner, Joey Dunlop, and he stalled the engine. Well, that's costing valuable seconds at the start, and you cannot afford to do that if you're chasing win number 17. But he quickly regathers his thoughts, and he is away as Locker, Lucky Locker, from Roos near Cardiff, Bends it left and right and in toward Braddon Bridge. Number 10, Richard Coates, the local airline pilot with Manx Airlines. He'll start just before number 11, Philip McCallan. Fastest in practice, McCallan. And he is determined to snatch victory today. He's saluted him in the big bike class, but he wants this one. And he's away in fine style. Number 6, Joey Dunlop. That unmistakable style and the distinctive yellow helmet heralds the arrival of your man, Joey Dunlop. The Kronke body straight and early reports indicating that leading out on the circuit is number three, Ian Lucky Locker, albeit by just two slender seconds from Philip McCallum. And here they are on the Kronke body straight at 160 miles an hour plus. Number three, this then is Ian Locker, the early leader. Right with him, number two, Mark Baldwin. As number 10, Richard Coates heads in toward Braddon Bridge. Undercarriage up. And he's away, the airline pilot. The distinctive yellow helmet in the distance. This has got to be number six, King Joey. Corrected placings, one second down in third place on McKellen and two seconds down on Locker. But a few miles up the road, that most surely will change. Number 14, Jason Griffith. Another potential TT winner, former Manx Grand Prix winner, and he too, like Simpson, having a very rare outing on a 250. Well, this is uh, Bob Heath, uh, number nine, coming in toward the left hand at the top of the Cronker body, but in the distance, this is the man we're looking for, number 11, Philip McCallum, and he now is the leader. He is the leader on corrected time. It's McCallum from Joey Dunlop and Ian Locker, and uh, Brian Reed, number seven, is bringing up the fourth place. Ian Simpson is down in 7th or 8th place, halfway round lap number one. 
Number 52, the first of the 400, Ian Duffus. Super Sport 600 winner Ian Duffus under yellow flags. There must have been an incident of some sort there on the exit from the S Bend left and right hander. Joey Dunlop getting down with his knee on the tarmac at the gooseneck. Joey Dunlop some four seconds back on Philip McKellen as he now makes the climb up the mountain for the first time. Here's Brian Reed on the McAdoo Yamaha. Number seven, Brian Reed running fourth on corrected time, halfway round lap number one. 55, Jim Moody, last year's winner of the Supersport 400 event. And in fact, this, the same machine, it's the Motorcycle Centre of Stockport Yamaha that he rides, the exact machine that won last year's race. Number 11, leader on corrected time of the 250s, Philip McKellen out to salvage some respectability and get a win. Number one Simpson, and he looks so neat, he really does look neat, on this 250 rented racer, rented from Peter Paget, backed by Norrie Lindburn, the civil engineering contractor from Scotland. 14 swinging in, that's Jason Griffiths. Again, another rider who looks as if he's been riding 250s for many a season, but this a very rare 250 outing. Jerry Dunlop, as they come through to complete lap number one, Joey now within eight seconds of Philip McKellen, but just four seconds ahead of number three, Ian Locker, the Welshman, Ian Locker, and still lap record holder. Brian Reed, fourth, some four and a half seconds down on Ian Locker at the end of lap number one. And at the bottom of Bray Hill, Mark Baldwin, number two. Followed by number six, William Joseph Dunlop, McKellen. Still with this advantage, which is now some eight and a half seconds. The exciting style of Philip McKellen. Brian Reed, the quiet professional. Number seven, Brian Reed from Banbridge in Northern Ireland. Whilst Ballamunny's Joey Dunlop exercises caution as he passed that earlier incident at Braddon Bridge. Eight and 11 together, James Courtney, number eight, and the flying McCallan, number 11. And this is Brian Reed on the McAdoo Yamaha. McAdoo about nothing as the marshals scurry for safety. And we go on with Joey Dunlop. Hard against the stop, three locker. These are all leaderboard men heading up the mountain. And that's McCallan, and he really is leaving nothing to chance. McCallan wants this victory. But Joey Dunlop is putting on the charge and reducing the gap between himself and the race leader. Number 55, Jim Moody, the comfortable leader of the Supersport 400 category at the end of lap number one. 52, Ian Duffus running in second place. Joey Dunlop making inroads into the lead of Philip McKellen and at Ramsey he was just one second down on Philip McKellen. But it could all change when they come into the pits. Fuel stop time for number six, Jerry Dunlop. Now one second in front, and about ten seconds after that. One second there. In front, plus one. Plus one, plus ten. Davey Wood, the personal manager of Jerry Dunlop, issuing the instructions. A nice, clean, calm pit stop. Make sure the fuel is taken, and away he goes. Now, what about number 11, Philip McCallum? It could all hinge upon the pit stop. And what is the differential when they exit? Get forward of it. Get forward of it. Get forward of it. You can't go forward he's against the bloody wheel. More frenetic, it has to be said. And certainly quicker. But is it too quick? Have they put enough fuel in? And as they exit the pits, in fact, McCallum leads by 20 seconds. So it was all made up at the pits. Now they may well pay the penalty later on if there is insufficient juice in the tank. Seven, Brian Reed. Five, Chris Varga. Number 11, Philip McCallum giving chase. And McCallum now with two laps to go and reducing to the chequered flag. And he leads number six, Jerry Dunlop. And Dunlop surely must be resigned to the fact it will not be win number 17. This man, though, looking for win number four, Jim Moody. Ahead of number 52, Ian Duffus in the Supersport 400 category. Out on the starter button with the Sherlock Yamaha. And McCullen, race leader McCullen, makes the climb up the mountain ahead of Brian Reed and Chris Farger. 
and looking for his first victory of TT Week. Neil Richardson we travel with into the 120 mile an hour plus 13th milestone and the run down toward Kirk Michael Village. Seven, Brian Reed, 11, Philip McKellen. Number five, Chris Farga. And surely McKellen now thinking to himself, no way can he be beaten. The victory has got to be his as they start their fourth and final lap. Jim Moody all the time has been moving ahead in the Supersport 400 category and lazily pulls away out of Ramsey Hairpin. He really is the complete professional. And the man chasing that number one place, Philip McCallum, with still Brian Reed and Chris Farger in his slipstream. Number 14, Jason Griffiths. The run down from Signpost Corner. And number six, Joey Dunlop, running in second place, overtakes the fifth man on corrected time, and that is number one, Ian Simpson. But unbeknownst to the race fans, Joey Dunlop actually lost the foot peg on the right-hand side on lap number one. And here's McCallum. Still with his shadow, Brian Reed. Brian Reed third on corrected time as the two Ulstermen go through Ramsey Hairpin for the last time. And now with just the mountain climb to go, surely there is no way that McCallum is going to be deprived of that elusive win of this week. Number 14, Jason Griffiths. Good ride Jason Griffiths has had. He'll be on the lower echelons of the leaderboard. Oh, and he's run out of fuel, surely. Well, we thought that the pit stop was rather quick, and it obviously was too quick, and not enough fuel taken on board, and Philip McCallum has now paid the penalty. Well, 12 months ago, he actually forgot to go into pits lane and ran out of petrol out on the circuit. This time he's gone into the pits, not taken on enough. Who knows, perhaps next year he might get it right. But it's an amazing win, number 17, for Joey Dunlop. Oh, yeah, it's TT's a long way around, you here to keep going. And at the start of the last lap, were you expecting to lift the 17th TT? No, I didn't, know, but I just wanted to try and finish. Like, I knew I was lying in second place and I'd lost my foot rest and I was just hanging on, so I just wanted to keep on going. And their confirmation. Joey Dunlop claiming win number 17 from Brian Reed and the Welshman Jason Griffiths with Ian Simpson, Ian Locker and Gavin Lee rounding out the top six. And for the Supersport 400 race leader, it was an easy win number two for Jim Moody. Yeah, it was. Uh, the, you know, the race pretty much went according to plan and uh, just let it, just tried pretty hard in the first lap to try and make either time, a time difference or, you know, catch Ian Duffy's on the road. And I seemed to catch him on the first lap, which was pretty surprising, and I uh, just eased the pace instantly, you know, and so I stuck with him for a little while and just kept, kept trying to maintain a little pace and pull away a little bit in case we'd have missed out on the pit stop. And uh, the boys worked perfectly, we got a really good pit stop and just seemed to keep on increasing the lead. And then unfortunately he went out and we seemed to have a massive lead after that. It had been an emotional week for Jim Moody, but the true professional came home to get win number two ahead of Steve Linsdale and Dave Morris in third place. Welcome to the fourth edition of the TT Lock-In Live, the part of the TT Lock-In where we get a chance to sit down and have a chat with stars of the TT, both past and present. And obviously, we want to hear from you guys as well. So leave your comments down below. Let us know where you're tuning in from tonight. And obviously, get those questions in to our special guests. As ever, I'm joined. This list just keeps getting longer and longer of this man's achievements. Northwest 200 winner, British Super Sport winner, obviously TT winner as well. By the end of the week, he's going to be 1994 Egg and Spoon champion. It's Steve Plater. Steve, you're doing all right? Yeah, good. Thanks, Chris. It's been a good week so far. Great night with uh, Hickey yesterday. You know, the ultimate professional. Some great stories. A good talk through, obviously, the ultimate lap around the TT course. And some good feedback on social media. Thanks for all the kind comments with my lockdown hair. Orville. <laughs> I mean, don't look like Orville. I wasn't even going to mention that. Now, we've been watching the highlights from way back in 1994. It's a year I remember fondly. Wet, wet, wet is, um, we're at number one with Love Is All Around. John Major was in at number 10. The World Wide Web, it was only a few years old, but the idea of a virtual TT seemed like a distant future that was never going to happen. But hey, here we are. 
But one of the facts I found out from 1994, Steve Plater, was it was the first year you donned a pair of levers and became a motorcycle racer. Am I right in thinking that? March the 13th, 1994, Cabwell Park on the club circuit riding my CBR 600. Not only was it my first race meeting, I won first time out in all fairness. And in my mind, I was Kevin Swans winning a 500 Grand Prix. <laughs> Brilliant. And I bet the racing at the TT was a, was far from your mind at that point. And obviously the, the courses and the classes have changed significantly throughout. We've obviously still got the senior TT. That's the anything goes class. You've, we've now got the production class back then. That's now the super stock class. We've got the super sport classes. Back then it was split up between 600s and 400s, single cylinder racers. And then obviously we've got the mighty two stroke machines as well. Obviously they were phased out in 2004, I think, but back in 1994, they were absolutely in their prime. Steve, what was it like to race those little pocket rockets? Do you know what? Uh, obviously back then, you know, reli reliability wasn't quite as good, especially with the two strokes. So you could never really bank on, on the winners. And there was quite different levels in the, in the rates of tune and obviously the support from the manufacturers. So it was great for the competitor. So many different classes you could ride on and so many different races. You could certainly get the mileage in uh, to help out, obviously finding your way around the TT course. Yeah, it's great that they're still there at the TT course. Obviously, thanks to the classic TT, you can see them at the lightweight TT. Right, without further ado, let's get our first guest on tonight. We've just seen him in action. He's an 11-time TT winner, and he was the first man, let me get this right, the first man to win four races in a week at the TT. That went unmatched all the way up to 2010, obviously, with Ian Hutchinson. It's Philip McCallan. Philip, how are you doing? I've never Sorry, met mate. an Irish road racer who hasn't got a pair of nads that you have to put in a wheelbarrow. Honestly, he was a brave boy. Phil McCallum will be forever remembered as being the first rider to win four TT races in a week. Uh, not again. <laughs> He's eighth in the list of all-time winners with his 11 victories on the mountain course, spanning a period of six years, all of which were with Honda. I remember doing the interview with him and him like wanting to strangle me because <laughs> he sort of lived off being the only man to win four in a week for so many years. But um, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy, Philip, and uh, you know, I've, Got on with him a lot ever since I did beat his record, and I think he was pleased for me. Phil, well, I can remember uh, being with the camera crew filming uh, Philip uh, in his prime, and uh, the shots of his eyes uh, would have just frightened all the competition away, and probably the birds as well. Nick Jeffries for Honda, and his teammate Philip McCallan is already catching him. And big, big wobble at Black Dub. Everyone thought Philip McCallan was in his caravan howling at the moon, but actually he was in his caravan plotting how to beat them the next day, and that's what he did. His aggression was unbelievable, and I always remember, you know, when I used to come over and sleep in a van on the prom and watch the race, and he, he always stood out, did, did McCallan, and uh, I remember looking around the Castrol Hondas and bikes he rode and just in awe of what, you know, he had. Let's try that one again. Philip McCallan, welcome to the TT Lock in Live. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, thank you. And uh, one minute I'm smiling and happy. I mean, you can tell I love that place. You know, the speed, the thrill of riding around the TT is just unbelievable. And, and to stand on that top step at the TT in whatever race, is just, there's no feeling in the world like it. And uh, you just, when you do it once, you just want to do it again and again. And uh, then as Hutchie said there, I was the, the king for a long time with four TT wins in a week and he managed to pip five on there. But to be honest, I've got the greatest respect for him, you know, for doing that because, you know, to win one TT, as Steve Plater would know, is a great achievement by itself. You know, anyone will know to win a TT, it's the biggest, best road race in the world. So, you know, you are the best road racer in that class when you stand on the top step. Um, so it's just, it's, it's an unbelievable, just what a feeling to win a TT. 
Philip, great to see you and good to have you here with us. Now, about now at the TT, we'll be kind of chilling out, having a few drinks at the trackside bar after watching another fabulous day's racing, the lightweight race and the soup sport race. But hey ho, we're stuck here instead. Now, how have you been keeping busy, you know, without your normal pilgrimage across the Irish Sea? Busy in that shop of yours, I guess, earning a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, well, you can see all those bikes behind here. Uh, we have to, you know what I mean? It's a very, very tough time for any business. And here we've been closed, you know, officially, uh, we've been closed for, what's that, like three months nearly now. And you lose a lot of business. We still go in our workshop, we're still going, and our sales is up and going now. And lucky, lucky at the minute, sort of, everyone sort of said, thankfully, I can buy a bike. So, yes, bike sales are good at the minute. Uh, the good thing about a bike shop working here really is, you know, I mix every day with the same people that go to watch the TT, go to watch other road races. And uh, so we we, can, we have a great rapport and we can talk the same talk. So, yes, at the minute, life's pretty good. Yes, we would like more business. But, I mean, this this is a fact in the world. This virus is, you know, it's all over the world. It's not just my shop. It's not just yours. Uh, it's all over the world. And we just have to adapt, cope with it and go forward. Now, I know it's been a while and you've had more bangs on the head than I have, but if you can, you know, cast your mind back to that 1994. You'd already won three TTs previous to that event. Uh, you was in the full factory, the Pucker Honda Racing Factory team on the RC45 with a fabulous lineup. Steve Hislop, the late, great Steve Hislop, and of course, Joey Dunlop, somebody you really look up to. Now, yeah, he was all he was in a fabulous Castrol Honda colours, you know, um, exciting new machine in a big class. It must have been great memories for you, especially being alongside your hero. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant, as you know, Steve Heslop, I and Joy, we were all teammates. And uh, the, the biggest trouble we had in 94, as you know, was the RC45 was just new at the time. And it wasn't, uh, you know, the, the people who watched it and raced it, the bike wasn't perfect. You know, and it's um, we had lots and lots of stuff to change and do. And Steve and I, we shared a garage in life, as you know, at the Honda workshops. And just across the the park, and the uh, and in the same area as ours was Honda World Superbike Boys, who they were going on the RC forty fives for the first time as well. So we would get some information back from them. But we tried everybody. We tried many many things, and Honda made many parts, and there was many sort of, you know, private companies making parts with the knowledge they had to try and make the RC45 better. So we went to the TT with a bike that wasn't just perfect. And uh, we had some, it was going to be really the biggest, you know, it was a massive TT race for me. We had Joey, the TT champion, Hizzy, who was another TT champion and still is. And uh, my aim was to beat both of them. Uh, in, the, in the F1 race at the start of the week, I got a second to Hizzy. We had suspension trouble. So the 600, I had a fourth place and that things weren't perfect. But if there's one race I did want, was that 250 race. And we all think you, all racers, when you ride a big bike, when you ride a 750 or a 1,000 cc, you know, a 250 is a toy. I mean, that's that's the baby in the family. And to me, that was, should have been every time the easiest TT race to win. But just I had no luck and I made mistakes, you know. I made mistakes and things went wrong, 91, 92, 93. I was having a dice. I forgot to stop for petrol. So 94, <laughs> you know, the bike was good. I was fastest in practice, and I wanted to win that race. You know, so you just said the F1 race at the start of the week on the RC45, you, you finished second to Hizzy, which is a fabulous result. But you said earlier in the VT that you kind of uh, treated the 250 like a little toy, you know, and it was just a, a kind of a, a fun race, really. But we can see you buzzing around there and from your body language in typical McCallum style, all that competitiveness and sheer determination, you really wanted that win. Well, I wanted it. You know, there's no doubt about it. And I mean, because sort of we thought it was, it's not an easy race. No race is easy to win. But, you know, and, and a big bike, as you know, the energy and the effort needed to change direction, to stop it, to start it is like, it's tough work. And I was fit for it. There's no problem. So this 250 was going to be, you know, you know my style. I pull it in. I'm not afraid. You know, Joey is smooth and precise and, and sits there. Was, you know, if I need that bike to move, I just pull it. And uh, in theory, you know, the 250 was you don't want to be cocky, you don't want to be anything like that. But, you know, we thought 
I say we went good in practice. We were quickest and we thought, right, just no wins guaranteed, but just get it right, get everything right, get the pit stop right, get everything right, and the race should be ours, you know. And and it was going good. I, you know, we played it careful the first couple of laps. Uh, we'd done a good pit stop. The pit stop was, you know, uh, Joey lo- had lost a little bit of time. We made a little time. We only made, you know, probably four or five seconds. <laughs> now, looking back on it by not putting enough fuel in, but we believed there was enough fuel in. And, you know, just, you know, the thing, you just got it. You know, that race was mine. I have wanted to win a 250 race. Still today, I have no TT wins on a 250. And uh, I wanted that win so bad that, you know, I, I was going to ride my socks off to get that win. But when you run out of fuel, that's it. It's all over. Unbelievable. There was obviously another man in the pits at the same time as Philip, and we're going to introduce that man now. Five times a TT winner and also a world champion in the Formula 2. It's Brian Reed. Brian Reed out for a hat-trick of wins. Brian the gooseneck. Fourth place for him at the moment. Remember, he won the junior in 92 and again in 93. Ryan Reed with a real wheelie on the 250 at Agos Lee. Brian, how are you keeping, Brian? You all right? Brian, please tell me you can hear me. Well, what Brian is saying right now is he's very pleased to be joining us here. And while we feel Brian, Brian, are you there now? <laughs> no, his audio is still not there. So while Brian is waiting for his audio, St- Steve, let's pop back to you for a moment. Can you remember this race back at the TT? Or are you too too young for this? Listen, I'm far too young. Well, I look far too young anyway. No, seriously, I was I was involved with Honda at that time in all fairness. So kind of the TT wasn't on my radar to go and race there. However, I was sort of in very interested in uh, watching the action there and the other road races. And and of course, being involved with Honda. You had all your key riders, obviously Joey. I was looking up to meet the man and, and, and Philip and his love, all those big, massive names. And there were so many back then. The depth of field was massive. And obviously, one of the biggest talking points of this race, ideally, I want Brian to talk about it. So once Brian comes back in, Philip, do you want to um, do you want to talk about this moment um, that you both obviously you both entered the pits at the same time? Um, but for some reason, you uh, you decided to get out a little bit earlier than probably you should have, right? Yeah, at um, just that the uh, and that uh, pit stop. Just we believe we had it all worked out. You practice, you practice, you do everything to get it right. And the uh, the boys again, you know, your hands is your races in someone else's hands as well. And the mechanic just didn't put enough petrol in the tank. And uh, you know, we both come out together. Well, obviously, after a fact, was not enough petrol, but we come out together, and uh, so I knew like there was a second in it. I got that okay, and I, I put my head down, and I rode so hard. I remember thinking, I've got to get. Sometimes I'm a little bit greedy, you know. I don't. Uh, in the early days, you didn't sort of wait to the last lap. You wanted it all in the first lap. So I wanted that time back, and I did ride so hard uh, for that third lap. The times went up. I thought I was pretty safe and the fourth fourth lap in theory then was just to cruise home. But before that race, you know, you're going to be talking to Bran Reed. Bran Reed is another fast, fast 250 rider. And, uh, you know, these are all my sparring partners from every week. You know, Joey, Bran Reed, myself, them boys started before me, you know, so they had more experience than I had. But when I came on the scene, those were the boys to beat. So to be going to the TT with a teammate, joy racing again riders like Brian reed you know it was well it was the hair day it was fun it, it was great yeah and i believe we now have brian back on the line brian how are you hello yes i'm great i hope you can hear me this time we can yeah. hear you thank can you, you hear me? very much yes we, we, we're okay. good okay now, yeah i agree up Sorry, Steve was saying earlier to uh, to to Philip about 
he was going to be uh, obviously there was going to be a lot of racing today at, over on the TT. Had you any any plans to come over to the TT this year? Yeah, I never miss it. I haven't missed it for I don't know how many years. I'm um, over working in the hospitality every year, so uh, we're disappointed that we're missing all that. Um, as I grew up watching the, the TT as a child, you know, watching Hailwood, Hago, you know, and for me it was a dream to go to race in the Isle of Man and to win it then it was just beyond the wildest dreams. So, you know, it's a special place for me, a magical place and to win around the you know, the T T circuit, that's that's the ultimate that's as far as I'm concerned. Now, Brian, throughout your career, you were a real two-stroke specialist. You know, I believe you won the 250, the 350, and the 500 championships over in Ireland all in the same year. Now, a lot of our viewers that are watching now have probably never experienced riding a two-stroke even, you know, let alone around the DT core. How were they compared to a modern bike? Well, compared to the modern bikes, two strokes, they weren't as reliable. So, you know, to go to the TT, you had to have your bike properly set up. And um, even then, you know, it could seize because you've got the mountain to deal with and uh, the jetting is, uh, is always going to be affected. Um, so it was a difficult thing. Um, you know, there was a lot more breakdowns. And, you know, at the beginning, it was actually an achievement to finish a, a TT or the Manx, you know, uh, on two strokes. So they were, they were hard to set up. Um, and as you're correct, I did win. I was the first person to win the three Irish championships in one year. I think it was 1982. Brian, like looking back at two strokes, especially when when I watched them growing up, they were seen as a handful. And like you say, they had a reputation for not being the most reliable things. Is that your memory of them? Or is that just because we look back now with the modern day bikes that are just so reliable and much easier to ride? Yeah, well, when I first went, uh, you know, 250, 250 Yamaha, it didn't have a lot of power. And so it was really difficult to learn the TT circuit on that because if you weren't sure where you were going and you shut it off, it just lost power and you had to, to build back up again. So you learned early on, you know, it was important to carry speed through the corners. And, uh, you know, that that's the most important thing on the, on the 250 two stroke, you know, to, to carry the speed in the corners. So they probably, you know, just as quick round the corners and, you know, as I said, modern day bags, but you lost, uh, as I say, a lot of time if you if you had a shut off or that was a thing. And they were hard to set up and, uh, you know, they could seize at any time. You know, I was leading the the, the race in 1986 and, and I sucked in a stone and seized at Balak Bridge and threw me off there. And so that was a, another disappointment for me. Uh, so I injured myself as well. Now, Philip, you're watching that race. Uh, you can see the fuel splashing around on that 250 in the pit lane. I recognise that was Kev Stevenson and his dad, Dave Stevenson. Did you blame they, those guys for not putting the fuel in? Was there an un unhappy camp? I think probably Kevin, you know, is quite a famous mechanic now. So uh, he's probably, uh, that was in his early days, really, of, uh, you know, working with his dad and I. So I think, to be honest, you know, we were all close teams back then. You'd have ranted probably for, you know, an hour or so. You might have ranted afterwards. But the thing was, just look, forget about it. Get your head down and get on to the next race and try to win it. But, you know, I'm sure Kevin's watching this tonight. And, you know, everyone will see now it was Kevin who didn't put enough petrol in that bike. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know if you know that we, we changed the tank that year instead of refueling. So we had a yeah, really fast Brian, stop. Yeah, you cheated, didn't you? <laughs> Brian, you cheated, didn't no, you? No, no. I, I was, um, I I was, you, I was just about I caught you out, Philip, about because that's that. why you left the pits too early. You saw me go, so you <laughs> thought you'd better go, and that's why you didn't have enough fuel, mate. <laughs> so, yeah, Brian, we were just um, yeah. we were talking previously to, to Philip about that. Um, obviously, when we saw the highlights, I don't think it would fly nowadays at the TT, but there was... There was so much more hustle and bustle in the pits. When when Philip came into the pit, he's wedged up against your bike, and obviously the camera's on him, so we didn't actually see what happened. But like you said, you instead of fueling up, there was obviously some sort of pole there.
we would be at a word with the in the pit stop, so that's what we did. Or, uh, you know, the rules not Team was the same. Sorry, I said. Yeah, the pit and there was no speed limit at that time, so uh, you had to stop box, but if you did that, you could scream down to speed limit. So it was uh, really frantic and uh, it was in a recipe for disaster. Uh, but apart from that, not much has, not much has changed. Uh, you know, the, they announced uh, when the Norton team came to the TT <laughs> that they were the first ones to be using tire heaters. Um, but they didn't know I'd been using tire heaters there for two years before that. Nobody knew. Philip, you didn't even know <laughs> we had tire heaters years before anybody else. So, um, you know, that, that's one of the things that's changed, you know, the, all the tire heating, you know, on, on the Glen Country Road just before the start of the race, cluttered up uh, with uh, generators and tire heaters right to the last moment. So that, that's one of the things that's changed. Philip, what about you? The biggest differences, mate, between that kind of era and, and the modern day racing now? I think uh, we, we've got rules now that we didn't have then, you know, and uh, health and safety. I mean, when you look at the TT back then, you know, the health and safety people now will, you know, grow horns and go mad, you know, if, if they were there, you know, like I say, you come into that pit box, you know, uh, even I remember the pit box coming in, the stop box, that didn't used to be there either. And it was just flat out, you know, on the brakes, get stopped for your pit, refuel and get out. So, uh, you know, it, it progressed over the years. We had a pit box to stop in. And of course, you know, you had to be careful to get that right. So that was a challenge then accelerating again down to your pit. And again, you've seen some other stuff. You know, I've had a, a run in with Ian Locker in the pits, as you know, before, you know, Ian and I had a, I think I've had sort of little tuffles, uh, scuffles with, with a lot of riders at the TT because, you know, you can tell I wanted to win the TT. I love the TT and just, you know, the thrill of winning the TT. And the great thing about the TT I loved was the, the distance, the miles, you know, back home here, we, we were still, you know, better than most places. We had races, you know, like 50 and 100 mile races. So you had, you know, half and nearly one hour races, which was absolutely great. But when you went to the TT, you know, a senior with six laps, you know, like 120 minutes of flat out racing. You know, I know it's much quicker now. You don't get value for money the same now. They're going so fast. But, you know, in the 250, to get four laps of the TT, you know, 40, 80, 160 miles, 150 miles, you know, that was just unbelievable. You, you just loved it. And I think that's part of the attraction today at the TT. But basically, look, things have changed like it has in the world. There is more rules. There is more regulation. And health and safety is a, is a big, big part of it now. But look, it's still the same. It's one man on his bike, obey the rules and, and win the race. Gents, I'm going to put this question to, to all three of you, really. Um, 
obviously we again we saw in the highlights that there's there were various different points on the track where you didn't see as many fans back there where you do now like Cronky Volley for instance Brian obviously you said you've been coming to the TT year on year how have you seen the fans change and, and the crowds change throughout those years um, well, we, we have a great photograph here uh, of me at Ren Cullen and, you know, it's uh, on the back wheel at 130 mile an hour, whatever we're doing, and the banks around the outside of the circuit are just packed with people. And that was the one spot that I always wanted to go and watch from, um, and now you can't do it. Uh, you know, they've, uh, you know, they've grandstands there now, but it's just not the same. You're just not as close to the, to the circuit, and you don't get, the, you know, the... the atmosphere and the, you know the speed that people are going through there at you know that was one of my favorite places uh, you know to ride through on the bike and you know always my dream was to go there and, and watch um, and now you can't do it so um, just the people have moved to different points on the circuit now um, and if it's, a, if it's a nice day people tend to go up the mountain and uh, you know there's some great vantage points up there so uh, that's uh, from a Spectator point of view, I think that's that's the thing that's changed most. And how about you, Philip? Have you, have you noticed a difference, a change in it? Yeah, obviously. Again, we go back to the word health and safety. You know, uh, a lot of corners now, you know, where there was very very little runoff before, and and the corners were packed with people. You know, we've all seen the old pictures where there's people just everywhere, and really up the mountain was really you know back in the years gone by not so many went up the mountain because you had to go up in the morning and you had to stay there, you know, up early, early morning and had to stay there had to stay there late at night. So not many people went. But the whole island is more organized now. So you can get onto the mountain and stay and get back off it again much easier than you could years ago. So there does be people go up there. You know, like Brian says, there's grandstands in places now for for let people sit down instead of you know people right on the edge of the road where if there was an accident things would would go horribly wrong so i think yes it's like everything else it's modernizing health and safety and and the risks are there so they're moving the people sort of back more from the track and i'm trying to give everybody now you know years ago you sort of the spectators you got your box of sandwiches your flask of tea or coffee and you went off for the day and you stayed there was sort of people don't want to do that anymore you know yes there is a lot of people do but you know the people now we all we're getting soft we want a bit more hospitality we want a seat instead of that and we want sort of regular warm coffee so yes things have changed but it's still the same the people go there because they love bike racing yeah i'm sure the diehard fans are still up on the uh, on the mountain with their flasks how have you seen it change steve obviously you've not been there for as long as uh, the guys here but in your short period well relatively long period of a career at the TT. Did you see changes in the amount of fans that were coming across and, and kind of where they were watching from? Yeah, of course, you know, with the TV coverage now, it's kind of spread, you know, far, far further afield and it's worldwide. You know, everywhere I kind of travel around the world, people are talking about the TT. What a fabulous place and uh, an iconic, obviously, uh, exciting race to watch. There's more people visiting, of course. Now it's hard work for those two weeks to cram all the people on the island. And the boys have pretty much covered it. There's so many great places to watch now. You know, some places are restricted, of course, because the speeds are so, so high. The last thing, obviously, the organisers need is any spectators getting hurt. But uh, there's some massive changes. You know, and I know even Gary Thompson, the clerk, of course, they're always looking at extra things to keep people safe, but also desperately trying to keep them right on the edge of the road watching some fabulous action as well. Yeah, right. It's about time, I think, we head over to the questions from the general public. So I'm going to have a little flick through my questions here. And um, I'm going to ask this one to Philip. Philip, if you could keep just one of your trophies, which one would it be? I think it's probably your first TT win. You know, um, my first TT win was the, was the Formula One race in 1992. And we were sort of in theory, we shouldn't have won that race. There was myself on the Honda RC30, which was out of date by then. Foggy was on the Yamaha. That was a very competitive bike, and his, he was on a Norton. So that's probably my first TT win was a Formula One race against those boys. So, yes, probably I'd like to keep that trophy. And not only that, it's worth a lot of money today, that trophy. <laughs> right. So it would be worth keeping <laughs> A question to both of you, Brian, first, please. 
If you could name any corner after yourself, which one would it be? Um, as I said before, um, Ren Cullen, I loved, uh, I loved Ren Cullen. Um, when I first went to the TT, it was one of my bogey corners. I couldn't get it right at all. And one, one of my two strokes, we, we broke down there. And it was the year Phil Reed came with his RG. And I stood and watched all the lines through Ren Cullen. And I watched Phil Reed come through. And I just thought, wow, that's how you do it. And then I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get back to the grandstand to get on another bike to go and try what Phil Reed had showed me. And it became went from being, you know, the corner that I least liked to, to my favourite corner on the on the on that circuit. Uh, so Ren Cullen, I would like I would like that. <laughs> I would hardly rename it now, but <laughs> that would, that's the one of one of my favourite corners. Brilliant. Um mine I love every corner, do you know what I mean? It's just uh Every corner, I just, I don't have a like and a dislike for corners really, because when you have a dislike for a corner, you don't try hard enough there. And when you have a real love for a corner, you try too hard in that corner. So I, I treat them all just, I love every corner and go as fast as I can around it. But probably, you know, one corner I did like, and I, I can't remember the name of it, so you expert can help me, help me, Brian, especially the corner before Balaf Bridge, you know, the right-hander, what's that one called? Just one back up the road from Balaf Bridge. Um, I'm not sure if some of you use experts. Well, that corner there, I love that corner because, like in my 600, especially, I could hold that flat in sixth gear, you know, and that was a big, big thing then. And I could get a two wheel drift, right? And, you know, you tell me, you know, we do it when we're on top form. So I could tip into that corner. I think just hold it flat and the two wheels would just slide right out till it's on the curb on the left hand side. And the first time I'd done it, I can't remember which year it was, you know, in those early 90s on a 600, there used to be people down the outside of the road there. And the people that was that was there then mm -hmm. will remember it now right to the day because they all ran. You know, this bike was sliding <laughs> two wheels towards the curb. Everyone, I could see them, they all running back and starting to dip into the hedge. You know, they thought, right, the spike's coming. And I remember smiling under my helmet, just hanging on to that trap and saying, no, no, I'm just coming to the curb, you know. So that, that's one corner I do remember well because I could practice sliding on it, you know. Right, so we that's need to find uh, out what that corner is. Alpine Cottage, is that what it's called, Philip? I think, uh, I think you're right, new Brand. Philip McKellen I think you're right. I think if the new Philip McKellen was coming, they wouldn't have been standing there. <laughs> yeah, no, the people, I'll never forget, I was watching the ball, they're all jumping back into the hedge, thinking he's coming through, but me smiling, no, no, I'm under control. Even though it didn't look like it, I was under control. Brilliant. Next question coming in from the public is, um, Brian, to you, what is your favourite or what is your top TT win that you've had? Oh, like like Philip, probably in the first one was very special because um, I was riding in it was a Formula Two World Championship race, um, so I won that. Um, so that helped me to go on and win the championship, and also it gave Mick Mooney, who was a great sponsor from from Northern Ireland, uh, you know, and a great friend of mine. It gave him his his first TT win as well. So um, you know, and he was getting on in years at the time. Um, so that was a you know, very emotional that day for for himself and myself. You know, as Mick had sponsored a lot of people over the years and spent a lot of money. Um, and he, he tried to win the TT, and he had raced over here himself way back in the in the 1940s. Um, so that was that was a very special day. And probably the other one was to the 1992 race with Steve Hislop, which was a really close finish. Um, and I had started at number five, and he was, I think, 19. So I crossed the line and didn't know whether I'd won the race and had to wait those those minutes to, to find out whether I was a winner or not. And then have the elation whenever, you know, we heard the commentary that uh, Steve had crossed the line and, and, and I was a winner. So, uh, and Steve and me were always great friends and had a lot of respect for each other. So, um, and to beat him, he was you know, known as the, the king of the mountain, to, to beat him over the mountain in that last lap was, was extra special. 
Yeah, I um, I, I guess they're a bit like your uh, your children. You shouldn't have a favorite, but there are there is always one favorite. Is that is that the same case with you, Phil? That you were uh, your first win was your your favorite. I think so. Yes, you know we've had many, many. Every win, to be honest, you know you love it. You know because you don't get a win without trying, without giving it a hundred percent. You don't get a win because opposition like Brian Reed and and Joey Dunlop was there most of my whole career. I was racing against those boys, and they were good riders. So every win was was just had a different reason. You know, if I sat and thought, there's like hundreds of wins. I loved every one of them. But I think yes. You know the the TT win to win a TT your first time standing on the top step with bike with riders like Carl Fogarty, Steve Hasler, Brian Reed, Joey Dunlop, on a bike really that was sort of uh, it shouldn't really have won an RC30 back then uh, they were finished but so it was great so probably yes my first TT win was was the one. We'll go with uh, with Brian again, please. Question to you both uh, from the public now. How tough was it to walk away from a sport you loved so much? Yeah, um, well, the decision was sort of made for me. Uh, my last race I was involved in a crash. Uh, uh, Ian King crashed in front of me at the Temple 100 and yeah, left me nowhere to go. I couldn't, I couldn't avoid him um, and I was fairly badly injured. Um, so I thought long and hard about it and uh, the recover, recovery time was was long, um, so I had a I had a quite a long time to think about it, and I did toy with the idea of continuing, um, but common sense prevailed, and I just thought I could race again, um, but I just couldn't crash again because I, you know I had I had just too many injuries at that last race, and I decided you know I'd had a good career, um, and when most of the things that I'd set out, you know, achieved most of my goals. So I thought, you know, it's time. It's just time, uh, you know. And I always said the joy, uh, and he he would have replied to me, you know, I don't know how you how you just stopped like that. And I couldn't do that. And you know, any time that we were together on our own, I just said, Joy, you've done enough. Why don't you just pack it in now? Uh, but obviously, it was in his too much in his blood, and he just did. Couldn't give it up, but uh, I think it was the right decision for me at the time. Brilliant. Uh, right, it was. Yeah, it is the hardest thing in the world to do, uh, and that's why so many people, okay, like Joey Dunlop, like Robert Dunlop, you know, they keep on going and going and going until sometimes it's too late. But uh, I was sort of always going to stop, you know. I started racing because I loved it. I wanted to go along. I started to win races. I wanted to win more races. And uh, but I was always, in theory, I'm an engineer by trade, so I always, you know, wanted to stop racing and go back to engineering and and use my skills there again. And uh, I'd had a couple of injuries. Really, I wanted what I wanted to do. Really, was I wanted to win five TTs in a week. And uh, I'd won five Northwest 200s. I'd won five Ulster Grand Prix. I'd won four TTs. And that was, again, my own fault. We didn't win five. In 97, I'd planned to win five TTs. I got three because I fell off the 250. Good luck with the 250. And uh, But then in 99, just I'd been injured in 98. I broke my back at Thruxton. And that was like a year recovery on that. And then in 99, my shoulder blade got dislocated from my back. And that was just an injury. And I remember after the TT in 99, thinking, right, well, it's, it's time to give up. But it was very, very hard because I was healed and recovered for 2000. And I had many, many offers from teams to go riding again. And it was tough to say no. But just I felt inside, right, I'd had my sport. I loved it. You know, I got to the top of my TT ladder and it was time to stop. Hard to do, but lucky then I was mixed up with Motorcycle City and the motorcycle trade. And I was mixed up with the media, with the BBC, with the TT. So it was easy in a way because I was still associating and mixing with the same people who supported me in racing. So I felt I was there and uh, and I was there, but there was no risk anymore. So it was time to stop. Gentlemen, as much as I'd like to sit here and listen to the stories of days gone by, I am going to have to say thank you so much for joining us on the TT Lock in Live. And I'm going to let you two go now. So Brian Reed and Philip McCallum, thank you so much for joining us tonight. 
Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, thank Steve. you for having us. <laughs> and, thank you. Uh, I suppose you thank Steve as well. Coming up after the break, we have got a very special feature coming from helmet designer Aldo Drudy. And stick around for race day number three, the virtual TT. I believe Connor Cummins might be in that one. Stay tuned, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, to this Arai video about the special limited edition 2020 Isle of Man TT designs. It's uh, very strange uh, times. Um, actually, we should should not be behind our desks uh, today, but instead uh, we should be at the Isle of Man with a big team of uh, of Arai technicians servicing many many helmets at our uh, service units, putting more than 15,000 tear offs on races helmets. And, uh, and still enjoying every minute of it. Um, it is, of course, a very understandable decision that the TT could not take place this year. But nevertheless, it was a very disappointing, uh, disappointing news that the TT could not be held. So we have to wait for next year to uh, enjoy the, uh, the event again. In these um, strange times, also new ideas are born. And that uh, gives us this opportunity to give you some background information about the TT helmets that we have made over the past years. Um, and since the very first special TT helmet that we have made, we asked no one less than Aldo Drudi from Italy to make this uh, special design for us. So Aldo is joining us today. Good afternoon, Aldo. Good to see you again. Ciao, ciao. Ciao to everyone. Ciao, Ingmar. Congratulations again with this uh, great design that you have made for us this year. Um, Although we, we know each other for, for a very long time, you have designed many helmets for RI, um, and you have done a lot of things in the motorcycle industry, even things uh, outside the motorcycle industry, but maybe it's good if you could briefly introduce yourself uh, to, uh, to all the viewers, uh, Aldo. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity, Ingmar, and uh, yes, I'm involved in the world of motorcycle from a long time. Fortunately, it's a long time. Uh, from the beginning of the 80s and um, start working when I was uh, around 20, 22 years old. And uh, one of the best opportunity I had uh, a few years later was to start working with Arai. You know, Arai was the brand coming on the market with a really nice shell with high technology, Japanese brand. So it was for us was a big news. And um, I had the big honor to start working uh, through some Italian riders, as Cadalora, for example. Uh, start working with Arai. Uh, and uh, 30 years ago, that we started to offer uh, uh, to offer a helmet service to the races at the at the Isle of Man, um, and we haven't missed any any TT since uh, since then. So we have a very strong connection with uh, with the Isle of Man. It was in, uh, in 2007, uh, for the 100 years anniversary of the TT, that we thought of making a special tribute, uh, tribute helmet uh, with a TT design. And uh, that was so much appreciated by many people that we decided a few years later uh, to make a kind, of, a kind of annual event of it by offering a limited edition 
of the TT designs uh, of the TT design every year. I moved to the TT collection, and uh, here we are with Stefano, Pablo. the guy working uh, with us by computer to develop the projects, and um, that is the, the the helmet that we create for this year. Unfortunately, no race, but um, but uh, we have the helmet, the special helmet. I hope the people like it because is uh, this year Ingmar is a classic uh, approach. The graphical items are the, the, the same of the begin because I think it's interesting to, to work with the same graphical items as the three legs. And there is a nice story about that. The shape of the circuit that you can see dark black on, on dark gray. And this, uh, the pattern of the flag, the checkered flag, made in a dark, in a dark way, the double T of the TT for sure. And we use the gold. The gold is a classic color. Black, gold, and red is, is the perfect color combination. Usually, uh, we create the next helmet after the feedback that we have of the previous one. As you can see, that was the helmet of last year. And the flashy yellow was characteristic for that helmet. So this year, we moved to a classic combination of color that is this one. Yeah, I don't have, Ingmar, I don't have the prototype. <laughs> Please send me one. Eh? <laughs> I will do. I, this is actually the, the, the first uh, sample that, uh, that you painted for us for this year. It's maybe interesting to explain uh, that uh, usually we, we, we start in September, around September, October, to get some ideas together for a, for a new design for the next year. So then we speak with, uh, with Aldo, Aldo Rodi, we speak with uh, the Isle of Man organization. And at the very end, when everybody is uh, happy with, uh, with the design that we have in mind, uh, Aldo starts to paint uh, one. These are going to, uh, to Arai in Japan, where the helmets are, uh, are being produced in order to have them in time for, uh, for, uh, for uh, yeah, by the end of May, beginning of June, uh, when, the, when the event is starting. Um, this year, it was a bit different because we already started to produce the helmets um, and uh, then the uh, cancellation of, the, uh, of this year's event uh, was announced by the uh, Isle of Man, unfortunately. Um, but we had already these helmets uh, shipped to, uh, to Japan. Um, our first reaction was to postpone the introduction of, uh, of uh, this year's uh, TT special uh, and to hold it for next year. But uh, we received so many requests from fans of the, of the Isle of Man TT, uh, requests to release the uh, limited uh, edition anyway this year. Um, so it's probably one of the uh, most uh, special editions, uh, the TT design of the TT that never happened. But uh, yeah, here is the, the, the first one that you actually, uh, actually painted uh, for us, Aldo. To see the, the prototyping, Marie, is, uh, is a big surprise because uh, was not under my eyes from a long time. So uh, looking at the helmet one more time, we are proud about the result and um, I think can be appreciated. Well, it's amazing, Aldo, that you always with the same components, eh, the same, same elements, you managed to create so many different, different designs, but all the, through the whole collection, you, you always find these three legs, you find the TT, Yes, Ingmar, but, but uh, trust me, uh, we made a good job, yes, but uh, thank you very much. But the, the graphical items are really, really strong. And when there is something coming from the history, as for example, the three legs, you cannot make mistake. Uh, if I make big mistake, you have to change the designer. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what do you see, Aldo, for the, for the future? Do you still have a lot of ideas to come up with new, uh, new designs with these, uh, with these uh, fixed elements uh, in the designs? How do, you, how do you get the 
new new ideas, new creative ideas for a, for a future design. Yes, um, as I said, it would be interesting to know uh, if the people uh, likes that element, but I'm sure that would be will be appreciated from the people, from the guys riding motorcycles, because it's, it's a classic and impossible to make a mistake. The balance of the color is nice, uh, dark in a way, but the touch of gold that is a rich color makes this, this element unique. So depending next year, if we have some new element to add to the classic items, graphical items to add on the helmet or if there is a special color that, that we can use and we will create the new proposal but but in the respect of the classic graphic approach because we have enough Ingmar we have enough every year is fantastic because it's in a way easy to create a, a consistent design because as I said the, the, the items are pep, are pep. There is no uh, other circuit having this kind of uh, arguments to be displayed on the edits. And we have, you have always made them on the, on the RX-7V. Eh? That was also our wish to, uh, to, to bring this special design on, on the, the helmet, that, on the model that most of the races are, uh, are using, eh? the RX-7V. Uh, 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 you have always said that you like to to make graphics on an RX-7V because of the shape. Uh... Correct, Ingmar, correct. Because um, uh, we have a relation with a lot of riders. Few of those riders, they don't use uh, uh, a Rai Emmet. But every time we, we work on a Rai Emmet, everything is coming, coming uh, more easy. Because the natural shape that is one strong argument about safety. The natural shape of the helmet is perfect also for me because the design work and turn better on the shape of one array helmets. Every time we put one, one design on, on a, one uh, Eric 7 shell, looks fantastic because I really, really love it. It's, it's not because I'm working with array and you know that all my best ideas are going on our MS production uh, and the relation with Japan and with you is fantastic and it's creative, it's a creative relationship. But to be honest, every time we put a design on, on a, a Rai shell, it looks better. That's because it's a natural shape designed by the safety and the wind. I really appreciate the, the, the approach that uh, Mr. and I have uh, for, for also for the next product. I saw many other helmets uh, dedicated to different uh, motorcycles, not only pure racing. And uh, it's fantastic to see that the, 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 the shell looks natural. That is the, the, the really argument. Yeah, and there is a nice, there is a, 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 a nice, uh, um, well, a very fascinating, fascinating situation there because the, the, the Arai family owns the, the Arai company and Mr. Mitch Arai and uh, his son Akihito Arai, they have one, one very clear goal for themselves and that is to make uh, the helmets as, uh, as, uh, as good as possible. Uh, to to increase the level of protection as much as uh, as uh, as uh, as we can, and that is also the reason why the helmet has such a round round shape uh, without uh, strange uh, strange squares or strange uh, indents or something in the helmet, but to make it as round as possible. And the reason is uh, for that is that every helmet, of course, when it has to do its job, it has to absorb a certain impact, uh, the, the energy that gets into the into the helmet. The helmet itself can only absorb so much energy. Um, there is a limit to, to, to any helmet. And by making this shape and by having this construction of the, of the shell itself, it, uh, it, can, it works to glance off certain, uh, certain impact, certain energy. And when energy doesn't get into the helmet, uh, there is, the, the, the helmet doesn't need to absorb that, kind, that, that amount of energy. 
And that is also why many of races uh, of the races are, are relying on RI because they, they know what can happen at the track. They know what can happen at the races, especially at the Isle of Man. So they want to make sure they have the best, the best protection that is possible. And, uh, and that is why nowadays you see something like 70% of the races using, using RI. Of course, some, some of them get the helmets from us, but uh, there's many of them who, uh, who, who just buy the helmets. And the, these helmets that these guys are using is exactly the same helmet that we have available, available for the consumer. So this one also with the TT design is, ex is, is uh, exactly the same helmet as many races are, uh, are using nowadays. Yes. You so know, the shape is uh, for design work, but, uh, but uh, has a real function of uh, yeah, improving the level of protection as, uh, as much as possible. You know, Ingmar, uh, I try to explain in my bad English, but uh, from my point of view, designer point of view, uh, in Italy, you know that the design is so important. But I think the, the right approach to create something new um, have to start from, from something strong. Helmets have to protect in the best way. Arai is the best helmet I manage. And, uh, and um, when you do your job on something that have this strong characteristic, this, this um, uh, you know, we are talking about something that can, can, can protect your head. Not only your head, because you remember many times we talk about dreams. The elements protect your head, but also your dreams. The dream to win a race, to dream, the dream to, to ride motorcycle in another country in a, in a fantastic shape or, or a, in, a, in a fantastic land. Um, the, the, is is a, a, a kind of dream of, uh, of freedom, of freedom, is important. So to put color on a shape that first of all is the best shape to protect your hand, your head, and, uh, and is the best shape in terms of design is fantastic. I think the future have to, to for, for a product as Emmets have to start from that base. For me, it's a, one honor to work on a, pro, on a product as one Arai shed is the best, honestly, honestly, is the best. Well, uh, let's hope that uh, next year we can uh, enjoy uh, another TT event again. I want to come with you to see the race. I want to be there. I've never been there before. Promise me. We, uh, I, I, will, I will absolutely promise you. Yeah, yeah. No, it will be nice. It, uh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, really a fantastic experience to be there. The atmosphere is great. The, the people really love racing, love motorcycling. Uh, so not only the races, but also the total environment is fantastic at the Isle of Man. So absolutely uh, uh, interesting to, uh, to, uh, to go there. So join us next year, uh, Aldo. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. So we have this, uh, this replica of the, of the TT that never happened is available. Uh, is uh, is uh, uh, from the beginning of June available at uh, at the selection of uh, Arai dealers uh, throughout uh, Europe. Um, although I would like to thank you very much for giving us some some background information about the designs that you have made for us for the TT in the last uh, 12, uh, 12 years. Um, if you are interested to know more about the uh, the helmets, some more detailed information, or about what I explained about this glancing off, uh, and this 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 uh, this uh, way of uh, of Arai to 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 make the the very best helmet uh, uh, as possible. Uh, we have made a video of that. It's called the Values of Arai, and it's uh, can be found also at the Isle of Man website on the Arai page over there. Uh, you can also find some uh, video about what's called through the visor which we made two years ago. Fantastic uh, interviews with races, with people behind the scenes as well. So absolutely worthwhile to, uh, to have a look there uh, on the uh, Isle of Man TT uh, website. Um, so thank you very, very much, uh, Aldo, for uh, joining us today. Uh, and I hope that we can see uh, many people next year again at the, uh, at the Isle of Man. 
Perfect. And uh, thank you very much, Ingmar. Thank you very much, Arai. And thank you very much for the, the people loving motorcycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. See you. Ciao. Keep safe. Okay. Bye bye. Hello and welcome to race day number three of the Virtual TT powered by Motul. The first two days have seen some amazing action. Team Coward managed to set a team time of 35 minutes and 13 seconds, thanks to a flat out lap from Jamie Coward on an R6 in 16 minutes and 37 seconds. Day number two saw the lead change twice. First at the hands of Team Martinez, who went 23 seconds faster than Team Coward, and Raul Martinez almost, almost beat Jamie Coward's lap time, losing out by only one second. It was then Team Todd's turn, and thanks to the gamer in the team, Sam, he managed to set a time only eight seconds slower than Jamie Coward. So it was all up to Davey Todd. All he had to do was set a reasonably fast time, try and keep it as fast and as consistent as possible, and they could be hitting the top spot in that leaderboard. Did he do it? Did he ever? He obliterated the lap record. 15 minutes and 44 seconds for Davey Todd. And in there was a couple of crashes as well, so he could have gone a lot, lot faster. So that's how the leaderboard stands halfway through the virtual TT. We still have another four teams ready to take on the challenge. And next up is Team Tony Uti. Back in 2019, he suffered a horrendous crash at the Dakar rally, which put him out of the 2019 TT. 2020 would have been his return, but unfortunately he's gonna to have to wait one more year. And a little fact about Julian Doniuti, and I don't know if this is an unfair advantage or not, I guess we'll find out soon, but Julian is the game's technical consultant. Make of that what you will. Julian, how are you? Uh, fine, thank you. Uh, and I noticed that you're uh, you're there with your your team manager. Is that Thierry? Uh, let let's make this clear that you guys live together, right? This is um, we're not breaking any laws, but with the social distance in there, are we? Thierry, and you, yeah. you yeah. Thierry, you have been teamed up with who I think and I believe is probably one of the fastest gamers on this game at the minute. It's Daryl from DG Gamer Tips over on YouTube. Daryl. I've seen a few of your videos over on YouTube, and um, it looks like you know your way around this TT course. To be honest, I've put too many hours in on that game, um, starting to have a nervous breakdown with a number of crashes that I've had. So, yeah, it's fantastic game, very difficult, very complicated, and, yeah, love every minute of it. Brilliant. And, uh, and what do you think of having that um, distinct advantage there in Julian, who is, as I say, one of the game's technical consultants? Yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, actually. I mean, I think you expect the gamer maybe to do better than the professional rider. But, you know, if he's been close to the action with the developer, then I'm starting to think maybe it's not such an easy win. Julian, uh, one question I want to ask. Uh, you are the technical consultant or one of them on the game's development. Uh, what bike did you choose to go for? On your lap of the TT course. Uh, for sure, uh, it just uh, takes his, uh, his bike because he is in the game. So he takes his uh, BMW S1000 RR. Well, let's see how much of an edge you have as we head over to the action now for Daryl's lap with Dave Moore.
Next on to Glen Crutchery Road to pit his skill of 37 and three quarter miles of the Isle of Man TT course is Daryl Grundy. He's opted to go for Dean Harrison's superbike, the Kawasaki ZX10. So Daryl Grundy is on his way, the clock is ticking and already screaming towards the top of Bray Hill. <laughs> Just touching, just short of 200 miles an hour. Through the bottom. So he's certainly got the speed, but does he have the technique to be able to slow, use the brakes, and get this mammoth machine around the corners in time? He takes it right to the edge. Oh, this could be good from Daryl Grundy. Early indications. He's fast, and he knows how to take the corners into Braddon Bridge. Davy Todd with the fastest time so far. This is going to be close into Glen Helen. Can he go inside three minutes 47? He might just be a shell. No, he's going to be outside, I think. Oh, 346, he's a second ahead. So. Daryl Grundy, new race leader, three minutes, 46 seconds at Glen Helen, one second ahead of Davy Todd. Raul Torres now third, 13 seconds back. Two seconds further back in fourth is Sam Tipper. And then another seven seconds back in fifth place is Jamie Coward. So we have a new race leader, and it's the gamer, Daryl Grundy, as he hairs along the cronky body straight towards the 11th milestone. Game on. Six minutes and 45 at Balaf for Daryl, four seconds down on Davy Todd. We pick him back up, heading into Ramsey. Oh, and he uses Steve Hislop's bus stop. So here we go, Ramsey, Parliament Square. Then the climb to May Hill. Oh, he's easily outside. He's lost more time. I suspected so. He had to be at the hairpin for 9.46. He's already past that mark. So Daryl Grundy. He's around the 10 minute mark. In fact, it is 10 minutes. So. He's lost a heap of time from Balaf to Ramsey. He's now 14 seconds down. That's nine seconds he lost on that section. So the early race leader, Daryl Grundy, slipping back. He still has a handsome advantage over Torres in third. Coward is now fourth, six seconds behind Torres. Sam Tipper is fifth, six seconds behind Coward. But remember, it's not about individual times, it's about combined team times. Julian Tenuti is to go next, and this is going to be a great lap. At the bungalow, Daryl is 26 seconds down on Todd, a great lap so far, but he's not going to catch Davey. We pick up Daryl at the world famous Kregna Bar. Really has to make this superbike work for him now. Right out to the edge of Kregna Bar. Second, third, fourth. Into fifth. And then mix into sixth. Again, big speed required down here. He wants big numbers on the speedometer. Quick reminder of Davy Todd's completed time was 15 minutes 44. So through Croc Nimona. Ooh, I think he may have made up a little bit of time. So signpost. Bedstead. 
keeps away from the pavement. And this is going to give himself a very good chance. Well, he certainly, as long as nothing calamitous happens between now and the chequered flag, he's certainly going to be second in the individual stakes. But it gives his team a great chance of overall honours. It's been a fantastic lap by Daryl Grundy. And I think he's made up time on this final sector. Indeed he has. He was 26 seconds down at the bungalow. He's certainly going to be in second place. Oh, and it's 13 seconds. He's made up 13 seconds on that final run down from the bungalow. Daryl, 15.57, the second fastest time, only 13 seconds behind Davey Todd. You've got to be happy with that one. Yay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was pretty rare for me to put in a clean lap like that. So pretty ecstatic. Well done, Davy. Though. Yeah. And that um, that I've noticed that a lot of the the riders are going for the um, the view of actually looking at the bike, whereas you're on the bike as the rider. Do you think that's an advantage or a disadvantage? How do you end up coming to to, to go with that view as opposed to the other one? Wouldn't you have thought it was the other way around? You know, the uh, professional riders want the handlebar cam and the other ones have the chase cam, the gamers have the chase cam. So, yeah, I just, you know, for me, I'm playing it because I'm not allowed a motorbike in real life. So that's as close as I can get to, you know, feeling the real experience. I think there is a slight downside. Uh, you certainly don't get as much uh, view of the corners coming up where you're that much closer to the action. Um, but it's more exciting that way and uh, it's more challenging, which I like. That was absolutely unbelievable. Now, let's hope that Julian can match that. If he does, your team is going to be on for a very fast time. So let's now head back to Dave Moore with Julian's lap. Julian Tonuti, no stranger to the Isle of Man TT. He's raced here in real life. And in fact, the only person ever to take on the challenge of the Isle of Man TT and the Dakar Rally. He's some boy, this Frenchman. How will he handle himself around the virtual TT powered by Motel? Well, he's following in the steps of his teammate Daryl Grundy. Daryl with a great lap. So he's given them both a good chance of taking the overall team honours. Tony T just a little bit cautious into quarter bridge. And if that is an indication, then I think Julian Tanuti will not be the fastest rider in this virtual TT powered by Motel. Easing off for Braddon Bridge. Very ragged. Some of the BMW. S1000RR. He's certainly able to use the power on the fast bits. Just got a little bit of an issue with the corners, of which there's a left and right here at Union Mills. As he goes into the foam fencing, Now, rider just up ahead of him should be able to negotiate his way past slower traffic through here, up into Crosby. Which he does, oh dear, oh dear. Just clips the fence on the entrance into Crosby Village. Back on his way again. So at the halfway house, just on the left, and the church with no roof, just on the right. Now into Greba Castle, the tricky right-hander. The left is nice, but this can suck you in. It can draw you right in. Now this time, can he make his way past the rider before they get to Balacrane? It's definitely the other riders putting Julien off. So around Greba Bridge. 
just can't find his way past the other rider. But he should do him down here into Balacrane. And it'll certainly cost him time if he's going to be caught up with slower traffic, especially on the run into Glen, into Glen Helen. Sixteen minutes fifty-two at the bungalow, and there's just about seven miles left to complete the lap. Now, can Julien reel in the rider ahead of him before the checkered flag? I think that's his target now. He just wants to make sure he doesn't overdo it at Hillbury. It's very fast in. Oh, that's nice. Very good from the Frenchman. Through Kronk Nimona. Still in ninth place. The tricky right-hander coming up at signpost. Oh dear, oh dear. He's in that duel yet again. Through Bedstead. Could all get a little bit gnarly, as the saying goes. As he goes through the nook, down into Governor's Bridge and the dip. The Julian Tenuti for Team Tenuti. Himself and Daryl Grundy, definitely fourth place in the team now, the team section. So over the line he'll go, ninth overall and fourth in the teams. Oh, Julian, that was a 20 minute, what was that, 20 minute 43 lap. How do you feel that went? Do you feel like you could have gone a bit faster? Yes, it's faster, it's a bit faster. In the real life, it's uh, more easy. <laughs> I don't, I don't think there's many people that would say that in real life that, that riding the TT is much easier. There you go. So, so Daryl, you get the tips off uh, Julian for real life and uh, Julian can get the tips off you for the game. Amazing lap times, but unfortunately, it's put you in fourth position overall, Jen. Daryl, second class this time, just behind Davey, as I said. More virtual TT powered by Motul after the break with Team Cummings. In the mid to late 90s, when World Superbike was in its prime, Honda soon got better for Ducati beating it with its 1,000cc V-twins. So they thought, anything you can do, we can do better. So they decided to build this, the VTR1000 SP1. Stunning, no compromises, HRC stickers. Can you believe it's 20 years old? So, we're going to give one away. Head to bennetts.co.uk to find out how. Welcome back to day number three of the Virtual TT powered by Motul. I may have noticed, yes, I have changed my t-shirt. It was an accident. Let's move on. Let's forget about it as we introduce the next team. We're on board then with Connor Cummings, first on the road. Over 
Connor, at what point am I going to be able to say that Connor Cummins was the last Manxman to win a TT? It's been going on too long now. Yeah, has been. Uh, it's been dragging on a bit. Hasn't it? <laughs> I keep trying. I keep trying, but no, and it's, listen, uh, many it's hard. Fans understand that. But but if there's there's one man that deserves it, who's put in the effort and the grind, it's you. And I think it's only it's surely it's only a matter of time. Do you still believe that that win is in in your grasp? Yeah, I still believe it's there, definitely. Um, otherwise, I won't go racing. It's as simple as that. Uh, the TT is uh, when it comes to training of a winter time. That's you know, for example, that's that's the only reason why I get up and go and go to the gym, get on me the motocross bike or enduro bike it's all about tt really and um i'm just really i'm not desperate i'm not uh i just really want it so i'll just keep trying until i achieve it so i do believe i can achieve it i really do i've asked a few people this as we head to uh, the virtual world are you going to um put it down on your cv if you manage to win this virtual tt as your first tt victory not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, ultimately, it might not actually be down to you whether you win this virtual TT, as you are teamed up with a with a gamer, and he joins us now, fellow Manxman Lewis. You there? I believe. Yeah, I'm here now. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? You're right. Hey, Lewis. I'm good, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, yeah, really well. So, um, you're obviously teamed up with Connor. We were just yep. chatting about, you know. It's only a matter of time, in my opinion, before Connor eventually gets his win. What do you think Without about his chances of uh, taking that victory? I, I, I think Connor's a great rider. I always have. Um, I think he's, his natural abilities is phenomenal. Um, and obviously being on the Isle of Man, uh, local knowledge is obviously a massive key. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's, it's not far away uh, at all. For a win. Now, I don't know who should be asking who for advice here because obviously, Connor, firstly, congratulations on becoming a dad for the second time. But surely that's not left a lot of time to be uh, to be practicing and playing games. Surely you've got other things to be doing. So maybe, Lewis, you should be um, offering Connor some advice on how to get around this TT course. Um, I mean, <laughs> in terms of racing it, I don't think I've got the knowledge that Connor has. Um, you know, it's just sort of, I don't know the, how different it is to, to real life, um, the game. Uh, it seems pretty similar, though, from, from like lines and things you have to take and breaking points and things like that. Well, let's ask Connor. Connor, what is it like compared to the, the real world? Uh, it's actually some... This, I, I mean, I am not a... I don't play computer games uh, and it, you, it's probably very very obvious when we watch the watch my laugh here uh, but <laughs> when i first went down bray hill i thought bloody hell this is this is really like close to it's just so fast so before we see how connor has got on let's head over now to dave moore with lewis's lap so it's louis porter on his way racing for team cummings on the Kawasaki, ridden by Dean Harrison, the Louis Porter through St. Indians down Bray Hill. Cerny knows his way around the circuit by the looks of things. It's a good, solid start from Louis Porter. Quarterbridge always a good indication, as we've seen from many of the gamers so far. So Louis Porter is on it. How much on it we'll know by the time he gets to Glen Helen. But good speed through Braddon Bridge. Good corner speed, or good corner exit speed, I should say. At Glen Helen, Lewis did a time of 4 minutes and 10 seconds and he is in a real battle with Coward and Tipper.
So he was sixth going into Glen Helen. Will he still be sixth or has he moved up the leaderboard? We're about to find out. It's going to be close. It's very, very, very close. Oh, 7.15. He's still a second behind Jamie Coward. Matching times from Glen Helen through to Ballard for Coward and Porter. But he stays in sixth place. One second behind Jamie Coward. And, of course, uh, Sam Tipper as well. That can't be... Uh, he's one second behind Sam Tipper. So Sam Tipper on 7.14. Jamie Cowd on 7.14. Louis Porter at 7.15 at Balaf. So he's got the possibility of making up two places. He's just one second behind the two riders ahead of him on the leaderboard. Along Solby Strait. He'd be looking for a little bit more top speed if he could, but that is maxing out. Ramsey Hairpin is the next timing point. Jamie Coward was 10.34 at that point. Sam Tipper was 10.40. So in Parliament Square. Louis Porter on the Kawasaki ZX6. So through Crookshanks up May Hill. It's going to be another close one. Certainly matching Coward. I think he'll be inside Tipper. And he'll certainly be close to Jamie Coward. He may still be trailing him. So into Ramsey Hairpin. Oh, he goes fourth. Fourth place. Up two positions. He's one second ahead of Jamie Coward. Coward, sorry. And another six seconds ahead of Sam Tipper. So Tipper goes down to sixth. Coward down to fifth and Porter up into fourth at Ramsey. At the bungalow, he's two seconds behind Coward in fifth place onto Kronk Namona. Just backs it off nicely for Hilbury, that's just good, then gets back on the power. Kronk Namona coming up, let's see how close they are at Kronk Namona. 15.44 for Jamie Coward. 15.41, so he's gained another second. That's three seconds ahead. And also, it has to be said, he's just a second off Raul Torres for third. So third could be on the cards. If he can find a second between now and the chequered flag. Oh, <laughs> he's prepared to use every little bit of the road and a little bit of the pavement in which to do so around Governors. Louis Porter could be finding himself in third place. Amazing, he was sixth at Glen Helen, and now he's racing for third place. Can he beat Raul Torres Martinez? Here we go, across the line, it's going to be close. Oh, he's a second ahead, well done. Third fastest lap so far. 16 minutes, 35 seconds. Lewis, that puts you third yeah. overall individually around the TT course you, you must be happy with that one yeah I mean like, like sort of I really wanted to just do a good time and sort of not show myself up <laughs> um being local is the sort of the key thing um I think so I was pretty pleased with that um I was I, my personal goal is to beat sort of the, the real or at least get close to the real lap record so I feel like that was a a, a good a good lap and also I felt good because I didn't crash Right, let's head over now to Dave Moore with Connor's lap. We pick up Connor as he heads into the first timing point at Glen Helen. So Connor Cummins, where will he slot into this leaderboard? It's going to be close. I think he's going to be outside the likes of Jamie Cowd, etc. at Glen Helen. Looking resplendent in the Milenko colours. 
So then, Connor Cummins arrives at Glen Helen. It's four minutes 19. So he's two seconds ahead of Aaron Hislop, who's on 421. Connor's 10 seconds down on the likes of Jamie Coward. However, he is ahead of the likes of Rennie Skaysbrook. Connor absolutely flying along on the Paget Superbike. I wonder if this early evening is his favourite time. Oh, not much room to get through, but he powers his way past. Down through Bishop's Court. And what is for him a home run? Born and bred in Ramsey, north of the island. Oh dear, oh dear, off at Alpine. Just clipped the curb. On his way yet again. Eleven minutes and five seconds, a very respectable time for Connor Cummins at the Ramsey Hairpin. We pick him back up at the mountain as he's approaching the bungalow. So here we go into the bungalow. 14 11 for Connor Cummins. So he's a good half a minute ahead of Aaron Hislop now. However, he is some distance, he's around half a minute on all of those ahead of him, the cowards, your tippers, your porters, etc. So pretty much a big gap to the riders in front of him and a big gap to the rider behind him. Although it was a good, uh, good run from Louis Porter. And a good run from Connor as well. Yeah, could put them in, could give them a good chance. It would be something incredible. In fact, I can't see there's any way that they'll beat Sam Tipper and Davey Todd so far. But they could be looking at second in the team overall. Connor down the middle of the road into the Craig Nabar. Swings and then rings the throttle. So Connor Cummins will be in seventh position. The way things are going so far, more riders still to come, of course. The likes of Peter Hickman and Mark Miller. Colin is not going to get the better of his teammate David Todd, that's for certain. I say when I say his teammate, his real Isle of Man teammate of Padgett's. But Louis Porter with a good time and Connor also with a strong time as well. This is really going to give them a fighting chance of certainly a podium position. And the fact that he's doing so well beating Aaron Hislop, I think they're going to be pushing Aaron Hislop and Raul Torres down the leaderboard by a place. Well, he was at, what, 16.27 at Cronk Nimona. It's going to be somewhere around the 17 and a half minute mark. Needs to get back on the power again. So Connor Cummins is going to complete his lap. And just roughly, I think this would give them second place overall. Team Cummins, 17.25. I think that second place overall will have to have it confirmed. Now, for somebody who borrowed a PlayStation 4 to actually use this game and, and get involved in the virtual TT, Connor, 
that was pretty impressive. A few crashes, 17 minutes and 25 seconds. You must be happy with that. I'll do. Yeah, it'll do. <laughs> yeah, just like on my reason. school report, it says must try harder. <laughs> it's reasonably consistent. And when you add it to Lewis's time, you boys are in second place. 34 minutes combined time overall. You're on the podium, boys. I'll do. Good. I will do. Yeah. <laughs> Who's buying the round? Yeah, I don't think uh, that's Lewis, seeing as he went the fastest. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, you happy with that? Yeah. Uh, uh, second place is, is, is good, yeah. Please with that. Day three of the virtual TT is in the bank, and I think it's fair to say Team Cummins pulled it out of the bag. They've slotted themselves into second place, but there's still one day of racing to go. Team Miller and Team Hickman are up next. Anything can happen. It could all change in the blink of an eye. So make sure you join us next time for the final day of racing on the virtual TT powered by Motul. And that's another show in the bank. Don't forget, as I said earlier, that brand new limited edition Arai RX7V Isle of Man TT edition is available now from your local Arai dealers. So make sure you head down there if you want to check that out. Loads coming up tomorrow. We've got the ultimate TT races presented by Bennett and we've got two legends from the TT in the lock-in live in Michael Rutter and John McGuinness. So make sure you're tuned in to the TT Lock-In tomorrow, fueled by Monster Energy. Monster Energy.